Okay, I think we're finally live. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Microbiome Labs uh, webinar series. I'm Acacia, a registered dietitian here with Microbiome Labs. And today we have Karan Krishnan, everyone's favorite microbiologist, here with us today. Um, so if you have not seen or heard Karan speak before, um, he is our chief scientific officer. He is a microbiologist. Um, and he actually has over 16 years of experience in the dietary supplement industry, which is super awesome. So we're really happy to have him on board. Um, and he also interestingly has um, some experience in conducting clinical trials in human nutrition. So he has a lot of good knowledge from both sides of that spectrum. And uh, today we're gonna talk about mitochondrial dysfunction. So originally we were going to have this be just about K2 in mitochondrial dysfunction, but we've decided to expand that to include the microbiome. So he's gonna to touch on that. And um, after the presentation, we'll leave about 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. And you guys can type your questions into the little comment box and I will ask those to Karan. And anything that we don't get to, we'll answer and we will send out in an email to everyone um, after the webinar. And we're also going to send you the slides. So don't feel like you have to just crazy take notes, but you totally can if you want to. Right. So take it away, Karan. Hi. Um, so this is our last webinar of the year. We've done a lot, um, of course, through our own educational program here at Microbiome Labs. And then um, I've done a few through other platforms as well. Um, so we've been doing a lot of webinars, been doing a lot of talking and a lot of um, trying to spill out a lot of knowledge. Um, this is a, a really important area. So when we, as Acacia mentioned, when we first started looking at this, we were looking at talking about K2 and its role in mitochondrial dysfunctions. Um, but as I was going through it, it, it just begs to be talked about to really bring in the microbiome side of things. Um, for, for people that aren't familiar with the microbiome connection to the mitochondria, I think it's extremely important to talk about that as well because, you know, we're getting more and more information on um, mitochondrial dysfunctions and all the diseases that it causes. So it becomes really important to understand what the role of the microbiome is in all of this. So this is a, a double feature, if you will. Um, there is going to be a portion on the uh, microbiome and mitochondria, and then of course the K2 and mitochondria as well. Um, and we'll just talk about mitochondrial dysfunctions in general too. So to give you an, an overview of that. So um, let me do the screen share thing and we'll go to some slides. All right, let's look at this. Sharing, just let me know if this looks right, Acacia. Mm, yeah, let me get you back on, okay. I think that's good. Um, hey, Karan, I might have accidentally turned on off your microphone. So if you can turn it back on. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, we're back. Um, <laughs> let's get back to the screen sharing thing here. Okay, and then uh, make sure you let me know if this looks right. Yeah, I think if you just put it in the presentation mode, you yep. slideshow, it'll be good. Okay, does it look good? Um, it's not in presentation mode yet. It's not yet. Okay, maybe it'll take in, on my laptop. It is, so it oh. might take a second to load. Hmm. All right, let me try that again. Sorry, guys. We're always uh, figuring this out here. One second. It never likes to work perfectly. No, never the first time. Okay, how about now? 
No, now I don't see it. Oh wait, it's coming. Yeah. Okay, just click the little slideshow. Uh, okay. So what did you have to click? Oh, I was just saying you should click the slideshow icon towards the bottom right, and it should. Yeah, for me it's in full presentation mode. Okay, then just go ahead and go with it. I don't know why okay. it's not blowing up. So. Can you can you see the slides though? Can you can you yeah. tell what's on it? Yeah. You can. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so let me get started. So this is uh, titled Mitochondria Microbiome Access. Um, that's that's another term that if you start researching, you'll find a lot of studies on it. Um, it's another one of the axes. You know, we, we know about the gut-brain axis, uh, the HPA axis, and basically all that means is that there's some really intricate control mechanisms between these two systems, the, our mitochondrial system and, of course, our microbiome as well. And, and then the subtitle here is Mitochondria Health, Dysfunction, and the Role of Microbiome, and of course, Vitamin K2 as well. So um, let's jump into this. So what are these mitochondria, just as a quick review? Uh, mitochondria are considered to be the powerhouse of the cell um, or power plant of the cell. They produce ATP. ATP, of course, for us and, and bacteria and most other living organisms, ATP is the energy currency that we have. Uh, they also control thermogenesis uh, within the cell structure themselves. So the production of heat to warm the body, keep the core temperature at the right, uh, at the right level. Um, they also do things like they're involved in calcium signaling uh, in the cell and then throughout the body as well. Uh, they produce yeah. some of this. Yep. The slides aren't changing, it looks like. Um, do you want to try to turn the screen share off real quick and try it again? I don't know why it's not clicking through. It totally worked last time. Are you, uh, does it still look like it's on the first slide? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me see here. There we go. That worked. All right, let me go back to it. And let me do this again. Okay, do you see slide number two? Mm -hmm. What are mitochondria? Yeah. Okay, tell me what switches to the next one. Did it? No. No. All right. Not sure what's in that. Sorry about this, guys. We normally don't have issue with the PowerPoint okay. version. Let me see if I share the entire screen if it does it. Okay, uh, do you see the yes. you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Tell me if it switches. Did it switch? Yep, perfect. Okay, awesome. We're back. <laughs> ah. If we can only figure out the technology, we'd be able to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll stick with the science. Sorry, guys. Again, we're not um, IT people, and uh, and you would think, after having done this forty times this year, that we would we would have it down. But it's always a little bit different. Um, so anyway, back to the uh, the presentation. So one of the other things that it controls are the, is the production of cholesterol. Um, which which then controls the production of steroid hormones. Um, apoptosis, which is actually something we'll talk about more. Um, apoptosis is programmed cell death, and without pro uh, appropriate controls within apoptosis, you end up getting what we call immortal cells, um, which are cancer cells. So apoptosis is controlled by the mitochondria, and that's a very important factor to keep in mind. Um, just general cellular homeostasis, the amount of substrate coming in, the amount of energy going out, all of the other outputs will give more information on each of that. Another one that's really important is insulin control. Um, and that'll become apparent in, in an example I'll give you down the, at the end of the presentation on some of the things that we do that actually really negatively affect the mitochondria. Um, and of course, mitochondria also produce reactive oxygen species, ROS. ROS is a subsequent um, metabolite, if you will, of regular cellular respiration. So throughout the process of making ATP, mitochondria inevitably produce 
ROS and um, ROS, you know, in some ways has a functionality within the within the cell structure, but for the most part, it's a waste product and needs to be quenched because ROS can be quite toxic to the cell. Um, it can interfere with DNA. It can interfere with proteins, glycoproteins, lipids. So it can create a lot of mess within the cell and cause the cell and the mitochondria to become dysfunction. And so RRS needs to be quenched and, and um, its production is a uh, major feature of uh, study for numerous chronic illnesses. So what is cellular um, homeostasis? So the first part is in order for the cell to, to be in a homeostatic environment, it has to have adequate substrate input. So all of the substrates that go into feeding the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, which then feeds the mitochondria to produce energy, um, those substrates have to come in, and that's things like oxygen, for example, uh, water. You know, many of these uh, processes are catalytic, meaning they require water. Um, and, and then also um, things like pyruvate, um, acetyl-CoA, um, you know, all of these uh, components that make NADPH, ATP, uh, which is adenosine triphosphate. So you need phosphates, you need adenosine. So you need all of these components that make up all of the metabolites and nutrients that allow you to conduct cellular respiration and end up with energy at the end, which is ATP. So substrate input is, is highly controlled by cell membranes of the of the um, of our cell wall structures, our cell uh, our cell membrane structures, and of course, in order for the substrates to get into the cell, they have to get into the body, and that is controlled by the gut lining. You know, the gut lining absorbs all of these nutrients from food, and of course, gut bacteria produce a lot of these nutrients in the gut from digesting our food. So um, just there alone, the microbiome plays a significant role here. Optimal electron transport. So the way the um, mitochondria functions is it has a electron transport chain. There are five complexes through which electrons have to be transported. Uh, there are carriers of electron transport. One of the ones that is very well known is CoQ10. So CoQ10 helps cells and helps cells of the heart um, and helps uh, cellular function by acting as a critical electron transporter through the electron transport chain. Without the electron transportation, you'll you never produce ATP out of the glucose and uh, pyruvate and acetyl-CoA and so on. Um, optimum ATP production, you, the cell has to maximize the number of ATP that it produces for every molecule of glucose that goes into the system um, or every fatty acid that goes into the system, depending on what it's burning at the moment. Now, the reason for that, um, and part of it comes back to ROS. Remember that just this process of breaking down glucose or breaking down fatty acids will release reactive oxygen species, which are toxigenic to the cell. And so if the cell doesn't maximize the number of ATP molecules it produces from a single fatty acid or a single glucose molecule, then what it's doing is, is it's becoming inefficient and it has to conduct metabolism more. And in, in, in order to conduct that cellular metabolism more, it's going to end up producing more ROS. So the more ATP can produce for each molecule of glucose, the better because it becomes more efficient. And the balance between energy output and ROS generation is, um, is in a nice homeostatic level. Um, uh, mitophagy is a really interesting thing. Mitophagy is actually the, um, the cellular process of getting rid of damaged mitochondria, damaged cellular structures, damaged DNA, just the process of being a cell and metabolizing nutrients, metabolizing carbon sources, producing energy, producing enzymes, producing fatty acids, all of these things that the cell does uh, will end up causing damage. It, the, these are like machines, you know, and, the, and they can have damage that occurs. And once they're damaged, they're no good to the system. And in fact, if they hang around, they can cause a significant amount of issues like cancer. Um, or it can choke up cells and cause cellular degeneration because these damaged particles are still sitting around. Uh, mitophagy is a way for your cells to get rid of mitochondria that are damaged. It's probably important to mention that you know, each cell can have anywhere from three, four to 2,400 mitochondria. So imagine our cells 
have a nucleus, have a cell membrane around. Uh, they have the cytoplasm, which is kind of the soup that's the, that everything is swimming around inside the cell. And they have these mitochondria all over the cell. And depending on the type of cell and the energy demand, it can increase the amount of mitochondria to, that the cell has. And, and a cell can have up to 2,000 or 2,400 mitochondria within it. Now, that process is something called biogenesis. It's called uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, and that is the ability of the cell to produce more mitochondria. So when you put more energy demands on your body, for example, your skeletal muscles, your skeletal muscles contain some of the most um, abundance of um, mitochondria within your body. And let's say you go for a run or you're, you're training for an event or you're putting a lot of stress on your skeletal muscles, it'll respond by enacting mitochondrial biogenesis by producing more mitochondria so that each muscle cell can produce more energy for you. And that's a very important process because mitochondrial bio, uh, biogenesis determines the effectiveness of the cell, whether the cell is producing enough ATP and certainly more ATP than it produces reactive oxygen species. Um, and then, of course, react, uh, ROS production has to also be quenched. So our body does have a natural defense mechanism against ROS production. Um, so superoxide dismutase is one. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is another. Uh, glutathione is another method of reducing the negative impact of reactive oxygen species or free radicals. You might you might hear them uh, being referred to as free radicals as well. So that's another um, important factor as well. Keep in mind that we have to have an antioxidant system within the body or within the cells to clear all of those ROSs, superoxide, dismutase, hydrogen peroxide, glutathione are the main ones. Um, and then, you know, further antioxidant production, I mentioned glutathione, but other things like catalase, um, antioxidants that, that come in from the diet all play a role to kind of reduce the oxidative stress around the tissues, around the muscles, because, again, this process of breaking down substrate to make energy is a very oxidative process. Now, all of this leads to something called redox balance, and that's something I want you guys to uh, remember and keep your mind on. It's, it's the balance between energy production and oxidative stress. That balance is called redox balance. If the balance tips towards oxidative stress, then the overall picture of, of your cellular respiration is negative because every time a glucose molecule comes in and your cells convert it to energy for you, it's producing more oxidative stress than energy, and that, that over time will create a significant amount of disease risk. Um, now, this can happen not just from the amount of energy that the mitochondria is able to produce, but also from the function of the antioxidant systems within the body. So if your glutathione levels are really low, if your superoxide dismutase production is really low, if your catalase and uh, hydrogen peroxide production is really low, then you'll, you'll end up having an imbalance in the redox system. Now, um, I'll talk later on about the idea of mitochondrial bioenergetics becomes really important. Um, so I want to just cover it here very quickly. This is how we study the effectiveness of mitochondrial respiration. So how well your mitochondria are producing energy, how efficient the mitochondria is producing energy. If you look at the chart on the left, um, this is actually done in a machine called a seahorse machine. It's a, um, you could take single cells or a few cells, put them into the machine and put substrates in and measure the amount of ATP coming out. And you can actually very, very um, intricately study every process, every part of uh, cellular respiration in that mitochondria. So you can understand how you can influence the mitochondrial output or, or decrease it in some way. So this is a bioenergetic curve. So what you see in the, where the blue column is, um, that level of production of ATP production is called the basal respiration rate. So imagine that that's your, your cells or all your cells um, in your body at resting rate. So that's just you sitting on a couch just breathing and functioning cognitively to some degree, not really doing anything um, of any uh, tremendous amount. That's called your basal respiration rate. Now, oligomycin is a mitochondrial toxin that can be added to a mitochondria that's functioning and respirating. And, and the reason you do that is we want to use the oligomycin 
to drop the ATP production down to its most base minimal level, uh, meaning we're almost choking off the mitochondria so that it can't produce any um, ATP anymore. So now we've taken it to rock bottom. Then we add a stimulant, which is a FCCP, and that shoots the mitochondrial ATP production up to its maximum level. So that shows you what the maximum level response is of that particular mitochondria or that particular cell. And so that gives you a picture of how much increase your particular cell or your particular mitochondria can, um, can actually express when demand is put on it. And then they, they add other um, mitochondrial toxins at the very end and that drops the activity back down. And then the, the difference between the basal respiration and the maximal respiration rate is something called the spare capacity. Now the spare capacity is what is used in mitochondrial bioenergetics to determine the efficiency and the strength and the functionality of the mitochondria. The bigger the spare capacity is, the healthier the mitochondria is, the healthier the cell is, and the more efficient the mitochondria is. So that's what's important about this bioenergetic curve. Just keep that spare capacity in mind. It'll become important um, a few slides down. Now, mitochondrial dysfunctions and redox imbalances um, are also now widely being used as part of a diagnostic marker for what we call free radical diseases. And these are conditions that are associated with um, overabundance of free radical production. And that means that balance I talked about, that redox balance, is off, where the energy production is less than the amount of reactive oxygen species being produced. And you've got an imbalance in the redox system, which means that you're, you're um, creating a really strong um, oxidative environment within your cell structures, within your tissues itself. And we now know that those things lead to a significant amount of disease. So all of this, again, comes back to redox balance. Uh, this paper is important. This is a 2017 paper, um, so it's very, very recent, and it's a good review paper if you want to look at the overall picture of utilizing mitochondrial dysfunction as a diagnostic tool um, to, or, or a tool to follow therapies to look at risk for certain types of diseases. Now, all of those free radical oxidative diseases can be categorized by this uh, schematic. And, in, and the thing is, it affects virtually every part of your body. As you can see in the schematic, it affects your eyes, your heart, your skin, kidneys, joints, of course, your lungs, brain, immune system, blood vessels, everything. And the reason for that is because virtually every cell in your body has mitochondria, except for red blood cells. So red blood cells are the ones that do not have mitochondria because they have one very important function, and that's to carry oxygen. Um, mitochondria suck up oxygen. So if your red blood cells had mitochondria, they would be sucking up the oxygen they're supposed to be carrying, and it would be a very inefficient system. So outside of the red blood cells, everything else seems to have mitochondria in it, and any cell that has mitochondria can end up with mitochondrial dysfunctions and an imbalance in the redox system. When you have an imbalance in the redox system, then that cell can get damaged. Once that cell is damage, other cells around it can get damaged, and that eventually leads to damage in the tissue itself. So in the eye, for example, this is responsible for macular degeneration, um, you know, retinal degeneration, cataract formation. In the heart, it's responsible for um, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, myocardial infarct infarctions, skin aging, sunburns, chronic kidney disease, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, asthma, COPD, uh, chronic inflammation, and so on. You can you can look at all these different conditions by yourself, but all of these things have been shown to have a, um, a function uh, or, or at least be affected by, in a significant way, uh, from free radical damage and, and redox imbalance. So cancer is one of the areas that are being studied quite widely for, uh, with this particular mechanism in mind. Um, and really, the new view on cancer is that it's a mitochondrial metabolic disease. Um, you know, 
cancer is not some something that um, certain people get just because they have uh, poor luck of the draw in terms of their genetics. There is a genetic component to it, obviously, but the thing that really sets off the disease in motion is inflammation and metabolic uh, distress and metabolic uh, dysfunction. And that metabolic dysfunction starts in the mitochondria. So we know that uh, mitochondria that controls apoptosis, uh, which is what controls the development of cancer cells, if mitochondria are dysfunctional, Functional, it can't control apoptosis, and you end up with these immortal cells that turn into cancer um, system. And so this is a really interesting um, study that illustrated uh, what they were able to show in terms of what influences cancer formation the most. So number one, the green cells are normal cells. Um, and these this experiment was actually done, uh, in vitro experiment, to, to show the impact of uh, the health of the mitochondria. Number two were particular type of cancer cells. So these are tumor cells um, that they'd isolated and they're able to grow up and, and then study. The third uh, combination was an incubation of taking normal, healthy cytoplasm. So that's the soup that contains all of the organelles and everything within the cell. And then they added that to the, to the nucleus from the tumor cell into the cytoplasm. Remember, your nucleus contains all of your important DNA. Um, your mitochondria has its own DNA. It's the only other organelle in the body or in the cell that has its own DNA, but it's got very few uh, genes. It's got, I think, somewhere around 22 or 23 genes versus 22 to 23,000 in your nucleus. So the question is, is the nuclear DNA, is that what is dictating whether or not a cell becomes a tumor cell or remains a normal cell. So they took a normal cell, they removed the, the normal healthy nucleus, and they put a tumor cell nucleus in it. And as it turns out, the cell stayed normal. So your the majority of your DNA, which is all the DNA that codes for your heredity and things like that, did not have an effect in creating a tumorgenic cell. But then they took the tumor cytoplasm, so that's a soup around that contains the uh, mitochondrial DNA, and then they added it to a, to a cell with a normal nucleus, and the cell turned into a cancer cell. So basically what this study showed was that um, the environment of the cell, the, the cytoplasm, so all the metabolites that are in it, all the fatty acids, all the proteins, all the signaling molecules that are in it, and the, um, the mitochondrial DNA are far more important in determining whether a cell becomes a cancer cell or not. Your nucleus, your DNA, your code for your body is not that important in determining whether or not you become uh, your cells end up becoming a cancer cell. So the condition of the cell, the environment inside the cell is really what determines it. And that was uh, very interesting. So then a healthy mitochondria, um, the idea then is that a healthy mitochondria could potentially reverse cancer, right? Because the the core DNA in the nucleus is not what's causing it. It's the environment within the cell. So the idea is, can we then change the environment within the cell to reverse the cancer process? And they've done studies now in vitro that have shown that introduction of non-cancerous mitochondria into highly malignant breast cancer cells can, can reverse the malignancy of those cells and basically downregulate all of these really important oncogenic factors and pathways. So oncogenic are the things that um, will, will push the cell towards becoming immortal and becoming cancer cell. So for example, unregulated cell growth, that is cell growth without apoptosis, is, is improved and re-regulated re when you put healthy mitochondria back into the cell. Viability under hypoxia, um, all, all reestablishes during with the healthy mitochondria. Anti-apoptotic practice uh, property, sorry, gets suppressed when you put a healthy mitochondria in the resistance to anti-cancer drugs gets reversed when you put a anti uh, healthy mitochondria in there. Of course, uh, invasion, colony forming, and soft agars, in in vivo tumor growth, all of those things show. Um, the ability of the cell to turn into a tumor, all of those things seem to be reversed when you add a healthy mitochondria back into a malignant cell. So in cancer, this is one of the most exciting areas of research because the idea is that if we can improve the mitochondria within the cell, 
we should be able to either slow down or stop or um, or maybe even reverse the process of cancer. And all of this dysfunction within the mitochondria occurs because of three main things. Low biogenesis, meaning um, a very slow amount of, um, of mitochondrial genesis, mitochondrial uh, formation within the cell. So the cell gets uh, ends up in a redox imbalance. Low uh, mitophagy, which is the um, ability for the cell to clean out the damaged parts of the mitochondria because the damaged DNA, the damaged cell structures are what turn into cancer cells. And then, of course, um, an imbalance in the redox system altogether. So this is, these three components are the major drivers behind a cell turning into a potential cancer cell versus staying a healthy cell. Here's another um, really interesting uh, review paper that talks about the crosstalk in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Both are neurodegenerative functions uh, or diseases. And in, in virtually all neurodegenerative diseases, you've got dysfunctional mitochondria at the core. So if you get a chance to read this paper, they, they talk about the, um, the driving of both of these conditions by oxidative stress. And, and then, which then leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. And again, these three factors end up playing a significant role in why the mitochondria are um, not functioning the way they should. And then that leads to the pathogenesis that can develop into Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Um, this is another interesting study looked at lung disease and mitochondrial dysfunction in lung disease. Um, and this study in particular focused on the, the whole idea of mitophagy and, and how a slowdown in mitophagy can allow the accumulation of debris in the cell. It can allow for the accumulation of fatty acids in the cell, um, damaged DNA, damaged proteins, and that basically destroys the organ that the cell makes up. And again, these same three things, low biogenesis, low mitophagy, and redox imbalance are the big drivers, in this case, in lung disease that, this, um, that the paper focused on. Um, here's another interesting one in this journal. We love this journal because, of course, this is where we publish our leaky gut study. Um, this looked at auto um, oxidative stress and um, cardiolipin, which is a, a, um, a marker that you can use uh, for looking at um, uh, cardiovascular disease risk and, of course, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well. And, and both of these conditions they show are driven through mitochondrial dysfunction. And again, mitochondrial dysfunction is a factor of these three features that occur within the cell structure itself. Um, this one shows uh, dysfunctional mitochondrial bioenergetics, what we've been talking about, and the pa pathogenesis of hepatic disorders. Now, hepatic disorders um, are becoming more and more prevalent these days. Um, the liver actually has some of the highest concentration of mitochondria compared to any other tissue in the body. And so the liver is very susceptible to oxidative damage, oxidative stress, and dysfunction in the bioenergetics of mitochondria, which then leads to things like fatty liver disease, liver cirrhosis, and, and uh, people succumbing to uh, liver failure in general. And again, these three features are the main driving forces in um, hepatic disorders as well. Um, of course, in every other thing that we talked about so far. Another big area, and we just came back from the big anti-aging show, the A4M show in Vegas, um, aging. Aging is a function of um, mitochondrial health. And there's something called the mitochondrial free radical theory of aging, M uh, MFRTA. Um, it basically shows that mitochondrial free radicals, which is a byproduct, of course, of normal metabolism, as we talked about, cause a significant amount of oxidative stress and damage. Now, according to the theory, the um, accumulation of this oxidative damage over time becomes the driving force behind the aging process because the aging process is characterized by um, degeneration of cells and then the degeneration of tissue that the cells make up. So when you talk about your skin and you talk about neurological systems, you talk about muscle systems, you talk about the brain, all of these things have high levels of mitochondria. And as those mitochondria over the years are working and producing energy, they're also producing a significant amount of oxidative damage. And that oxidative damage then leads to the damage and destruction of those tissues, which cause age-related degeneration of virtually all the uh, organ systems. And this was actually shown in a very interesting study uh, that was uh, published not too long ago. I think it was, um, 
not mistaken. Oh, this was in 1998. Yeah. Um, so this this study showed um, tissue samples, uh, muscle tissue samples of a 90 year old man, um, compared it to the muscle tissue samples of a five year old child. And when they were looking at the physical structure of the muscle tissue and the cellular structure, there was only one thing that they could discern was a significant difference in that the 90-year-old man contained up to 95% damaged mitochondria compared to almost no damaged mitochondria in a five-year-old. So the, the significant determining factor in whether or not you have the energy and the health and the, and the, the youthfulness of a five-year-old versus the lack of energy, the weakness, um, the incoherence of a 90-year-old is the number of damaged mitochondria within your tissue. So this was a, um, a study that actually uh, was considered a landmark study in the, in the areas of aging because it really proved that mitochondrial damage is a major driver of tissue degeneration and then aging and, of course, all the age-related diseases that come along with it. And in every case, this mitochondrial dysfunction goes back to low biogenesis, low mito uh, mitophagy, and a redox imbalance as well. So defective mitochondria triad, the triad, the three things we've been talking about, um, you know, basically flows like this to put it in summary for you guys. Low biogenesis within the mitochondria creates low levels of ATP, right? So now you have lower energy production within each cell. And so the cell is not as efficient as it should be. Now, when it's not efficient, we know that it causes um, uh, redox imbalance. Low mitophagy actually um, allows for higher reactive oxygen species accumulation. Um, it also allows for accumulation of defects within the cell itself that can lead to tumorigenic cells. Um, low levels of ATP, of course, because you're not clearing out the damaged mitochondria and replacing it with good mitochondria. And, and then there's a loss of apoptosis control because remember that the mitochondria is responsible for control of apoptosis within the cell. And when you have damage and dysfunctional mitochondria, you're not effectively controlling apoptosis. So you end up having uh, a higher risk for developing immortal cells. The last thing is the redox imbalance. The redox imbalance ends up causing cellular and, uh, and DNA damage because you've got more oxidative stress than you have energy production. You have, again, loss of ap uh, apoptosis control. You have the development of immortal cells. And then, of course, loss of healthy cells itself, which are important for the for, to create tissue function. So all of these things, low bioenergetics leads to fatigue, tissue degeneration, low uh, mitophagy leads to fatigue, tissue de degeneration, and possibly overgrowth of certain types of cells and tissues in the case of cancer or even non-malignant tumors, um, similar kind of effect. And then uh, redox imbalances also lead to fatigue, tissue degeneration and overgrowth, whether malignant or non-malignant. And all of these things affects virtually every part of your body, your neurons. Uh, virtually every neurodegenerative disease is um, characterized by this type of mitochondrial dysfunction, your muscles, so loss of muscle tone, muscle weakness, um, all of those things are related to mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, your mucosal system are made up of cells as well. All of those cells are susceptible to mitochondrial damage, which can weaken your mucosal system, weaken your immune system in that, in that respect. And then of course, immune cells themselves, each immune cell has its own mitochondria. So their immune cells don't have the energy they require or can't produce the energy they require or they're undergoing significant amount of oxidative stress themselves, they can't function to protect you. Uh, and that includes the Treg system um, and, and the production of T, uh, the T regulatory cells. All of these things require energy. All of these things require mitochondrial function. And all of these things are thus susceptible to mitochondrial dysfunction. Your skin, of course, and that becomes apparent in the case of aging, tendons, ligaments, your bones, your arteries, your veins. So every part of your body is susceptible to mitochondrial dysfunction from these three major factors uh, that drive the dysfunction. So then um, now that we understand the mitochondria, what it is, um, what does mitochondrial dysfunction look like, uh, what is the pathogenesis of mitochondrial dysfunction, and all the types of diseases that it can affect, um, it becomes important to start talking about solutions. Um, and in order to understand solutions, we have to understand the things that influence the mitochondria. And one of the really important things, and it's really come into light over the last kind of six, seven years, um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this is there's a lot of good 
presentations out there and papers on mitochondrial health, mitochondrial dysfunction, but I didn't find or see a lot on the microbiome mitochondrial access. So it's important for people to understand how the microbiome influences all of our mitochondria in our body, uh, wh where the connections are, so that when you're when you're looking at therapeutic value of the things you're doing to help with free radical disease, um, you, you will understand how to utilize the microbiome in order to really help that. So the uh, in order to understand the relationship, it's important to review what a eukaryotic cell is and a prokaryotic cell. So we are made up of eukaryotic cells. These are multicellular organisms, um, typically are made up of eukaryotic cells, and these cells are far more complex. They're larger, they have a nucleus in it, they have a nuclear membrane, uh, they have ribosomes, they have all of these different organelles and machines within the cell, and then they contain mitochondria. The mitochondria is, of course, the powerhouse of the entire cell. And as I mentioned before, eukaryotic cell can contain anywhere from four to 2,400 mitochondria in a single cell. So that's that's uh, where uh, that's how a eukaryotic cell is structured. Now, prokaryote or bacteria um, is is basically a single mitochondria floating around. Right, so bacteria, as we know, came way before eukaryotic cells. You know, the Earth started 13.8 or 14 billion years ago, um, and some of the initial life forms on Earth started around three or four billion years ago in the primordial soup, if you will. And some of the things that formed during that time were these um, these mitochondria, basically, that were independent living organisms uh, that were basically just a single mitochondria. They were the ancient bacteria of the time. So it's a single mitochondria that just kind of absorbed nutrients from its environment, conducted respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic, and produced energy for that mitochondria. Now, there, once we develop single cellular organisms, things like protozoa, as it turns out, in order to form a eukaryotic cell, the best explanation is that a bacteria basically entered a protozoa type of cell, and and the bacteria and the protozoa ended up fo forming this really amazing mutualistic um, uh, relationship, where the bacteria, which is a mitochondria, said, "I'm going to provide energy for you, um, for your structure, for your cell." You provide me the nutrients and the protection from the outside environment because of the cell membrane structure, and uh, let's form this beautiful mutualistic uh, relationship. So all of our mitochondria basically arose uh, from this mutualistic relationship between ancient bacteria and other single cell organisms. So our mitochondria that are sitting in our cell basically used to be bacteria by themselves. Right, so we are intimately connected with the bacterial world because the powerhouse of every one of our cells, the, the part that can drive all of the scary chronic illnesses when it goes dysfunctional, are bacteria, essentially. The cell-to-cell -cell communication that started between the um, single-cell organisms and the and the um, the mitochondria that they absorb, essentially bacteria, that that communication between those two different types of organisms created the opportunity for multicellular organisms. Because in order for an organism to exist as a multicellular organism, it has to be able to communicate between all of the cells. Our body would cease to exist today if our cells could not communicate with one another and, and communicate about energy homeostasis, uh, about thermal homeostasis, about invasions, uh, about toxins coming in, about metabolism, all of these things that are important for our, for our body to talk to itself uh, and communicate with itself all started because of a very intricate type of communication that was started by bacteria merging with single cell organisms. And this happens through metabolism, this happens through the immune system. So the single cell species and, and bacteria created what would become today's modern day immune system and today's modern day metabolic system as the matrix in which all of these cells communicate with one another. The host, which is us, our body, and our resident mitochondria, which used to be, again, ancient bacteria, and the microbiome, so all the bacteria that live in, uh, in and on us, the original mitochondria, uh, basically supplies essential metabolites to the host itself. So our mitochondria that's sitting in our cells 
are ancient bacteria that count on uh, modern day bacteria to provide it with essential nutrients that it requires to function. Because again, even though our, our cells are our own, they're eukaryotic cells, the mitochondria within our cells are ancient bacteria and the way they function as ancient bacteria still hold. And so they count on other bacteria to provide them with the metabolites they need in order to function for us. So our microbiome becomes an essential supplier of metabolites for our own mitochondria to function. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of them that have been identified, these metabolites, but the main key metabolites are short-chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, and we'll talk about how each one of these, what they do within the mitochondria itself. So um, in this slide, I'll just give you an overview. Um, something called uh, urolithins, urolithins, especially something called urolithin A, is a very, very important molecule for the health and function of the um, mitochondria in our cells, and it comes comes from the microbiome only. And then the last thing is lactate. Lactate actually plays an important role as well as a metabolite that influences our mitochondria. Now, what's beautiful about this whole thing is it's a self-perpetuating system. Our uh, nature has designed this system to perpetuate itself so the stronger it gets, the better the system becomes, and then the stronger it gets to improve the system. Let me give you an example. The more short chain fatty acids, lactate, and urolithins that your body produces, and when I say your body, I mean your microbiome because we can't produce these ourselves. The more of those that our microbiome produces, the more it actually increases the diversity of the microbiome because bacteria in your gut also utilize these metabolites for their own function, for their own development. And what what, it, what we find is that many of the good genres of bacteria utilize short chain fatty acids, lactate, and urolithins. So when you have groups of bacteria that, pro, that are producing high levels of these particular metabolites, they end up feeding other good bacterial groups who then in turn make more of these who then in turn feed other good bacteria. So more and more, the cycle just perpetuates itself. And of course, the more of all of these short chain fatty acids, lactin, urolithins we're producing, the healthier our mitochondria becomes. So this self-perpetuating system ends up being a huge um, proponent of our own health and wellness because even though they're feeding themselves and they're growing in diversity and that diversity is causing more of these metabolites to be produced, the end game for us is that all of those um, production of all of those metabolites ends up giving us healthier mitochondria. So let's talk about exactly how they do that. So with butyrate, to begin with, short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, increase something called AMP kinase. And AMP kinase actually increases uh, the mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, mitochondrial biogenesis, again, is the production of more mitochondria within the cell structure itself. And as we talked about earlier, that is critical to maintaining redox balance within the tissue, within the cells. AMP kinase is one of the most potent inducers of mitochondrial biogenesis, and that is... Um, upregulated by the presence of butyrate. So butyrate plays a huge role in that. Butyrate's also the main energy source of the mitochondria in our colonocytes. So uh, our entire um, colon uh, and all the colonocytes that make up the colon and all their responsibility for fermentation, uh, sorry, for absorbing fermentation byproducts for um, uh, transducing signals between the microbiome, the brain, and other organs, all of these amazing things, of course, that the colon does um, is dependent on the for formation of butyrate because that's the number one fuel for the mitochondria in our colonocyte cells. Butyrate also improves insulin regulation in the mitochondria and causes glucose homeostasis. I mentioned I think in the first or second slide that uh, one of the roles of the mitochondria is for insulin regulation. It is the, um, the powerhouse of the cell. It's the thing that is taking in glucose and, and pyruvate and acetyl-CoA and breaking it down into energy. And so it dictates our body's sensitivity to, glu to uh, glucose and insulin and, um, and glucose homeostasis in general. It also increases fatty acid beta oxidation. So your mitochondria um, and your cell can actually break down sugars um, or it can break down fat for energy. And if your fat breakdown is slow, 
um, and, and not very efficient, what happens is your cell ends up accumulating too many fatty acids. And when it accumulates a lot of fatty acids, it can lead to um, the destruction and damage of the cell because then those fatty acids get oxidized over time. So now imagine inside your cells, you have a whole bunch of oxidized fatty acids. Butyrate comes in and it increases something called beta oxidation, which is the process of breaking down fatty acids and turning that fatty acid into energy. So you become a really efficient fat burner and your cells aren't accumulating lipids within it itself. It also increases ATP output, so it improves the bioenergetics of the cell, which again, as we talked about before, was very important for the redox balance within the cell itself. So these are some of the most important things that butyrate from your gut does for every single cell in your body and every single mitochondria within that cell. Now, uh, urolithins are made by commensal flora from other tannins, um, and these tannins come in from fruits and berries and vegetables, um, anything with color in it, um, and anything that has high tannins, um, of course, wines and polyphenols and all those things. Um, basically, your, um, your gut bacteria will take these urolithins and produce something called urolithin A. Urolithin A is an ex extremely important compound for the health of the mitochondria because one of the first things it does is it stimulates the mit mitophagy. And if you recall, mitophagy is a very, very important part of keeping your cells clean and healthy, removing the damaged debris, removing the damaged mitochondria in particular, so that you can then induce biogenesis of mitochondria to replace the damaged mitochondria with a new clean functioning mitochondria. So it cleans up the cell and the mitochondria. And we know many of those diseases we talked about uh, earlier are, um, are a, a result of poor mitophagy and of course, poor uh, mitochondrial biogenesis as well. So urolithin A is actually one of the, um, per, the subsequent productions of uh, metabolizing pomegranate. Pomegranate tends to be really high in urolithins, and then if you have healthy bacteria within your gut, they'll convert it to the urolithin A, and that gives you um, a whole bunch of advantages in terms of uh, regenerating your cells and, and keeping them healthy and preventing aging. That's where all of the pomegranate research is, is in urolithins and identifying um, all of their mechanisms in which that they help the cell. Um, the other thing is uh, urolithins will then increase energy output because it allows for the um, removal of dysfunctional mitochondria and then replacement of that dysfunctional mitochondria with good functional mitochondria. And of course, that then improves the, the output of ATP and the capacity of the mitochondria, thereby providing more redox balance again. Then in uh, animal studies, this hasn't been done in humans yet, but in animal studies, they show that your lithin A seems to increase the longevity of the cell itself and the longevity of the mitochondria. So if you, if you take a cell and you incubate it with all of the substrates it needs uh, to function as a cell, and then in uh, one set of them, you provide your lithin A, the other set of cells, you don't provide your lithin A, um, the ones with that compound will actually live much longer. And then they've been able to show this in animals it's, uh, as well as cell cultures uh, where there's some component of longevity to the absorption of urolithin A and the function of it. And again, remember urolithin A has to be made by the microbiome. It is converted from other tannins and polyphenols. Um, you can't go out there and buy your urolithin A uh, supplement right now in pomegranate, you're getting your lithins, but you're not, unless you have a healthy microbiome to convert it to your lithin A, it's not really going to do its job. Lactic acid is interesting because lactic acid, you know, is produced by beneficial bacteria in the gut. And one of the big things it does is it helps support the growth of other beneficial bacteria within the gut, thereby increasing diversity and then also increasing the growth of other good bacteria that will produce more short-chain fatty acids and more urolithin as well. So um, lactic acid just kind of feeds the whole system in a positive way. Um, however, lactate, which is, of course, a derivative of lactic acid, is also used as a fuel source to feed mitochondria, especially in areas like your skeletal muscles and your cardiac muscles. So for the longest time, when you look at um, sports nutrition and, and people studying athletes, it was believed that when you develop or when you produce a certain amount of lactate from anaerobic respiration and you feel that burn in your muscle, 
then your muscle is going to go into failure at that point. But now we come to understand that lactate is actually a energy source as well. And the best athletes in the world, especially the endurance athletes, are the ones that can clear and metabolize lactate faster than their competitors. So they can actually use the lactate as an energy source um, and and um, rather than becoming really sore and uh, leading to muscle failure. So lactate is an, uh, an interesting thing. And of course, a lot of good bacteria within your body produce lactate, especially the L-positive form of lactic acid. So that's the um, the short version of the microbiome and your mitochondria. Um, the important thing to note is that came in were ancient bacteria now uh, because of a really interesting mutualistic um, reaction that happened where these mitochondria merged with these single cell organisms we now have this opportunity to become a, a multicellular organism and contain eukaryotic cells but those mitochondria are still ancient um, and they require bacteria to provide them with the essential nutrients to function properly. Um, and that's the big picture here. And, that, and then the three most important of those are short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, and of course urolithin, which is another um, very important one that requires a healthy microbiome in order to get adequate amounts. So now let's talk a little bit about vitamin K2 in the mitochondria and what it does within the mitochondria. And, and this was of course a major area of our research with vitamin K2. Um, and just to distinguish, remember there's two forms, two major forms of K2. There's a third form uh, called K3, but that's not important. Phyloquinone is a K1. K1 is found in leafy green vegetables. K1 functions in the liver for blood clotting. That's basically what it does. K2 is the extra hepatic form of vitamin K, meaning it's the one that leaves the liver. It doesn't really function much in blood clotting. It functions in the rest of the body um, in the cell at a cellular level. That's what vitamin K2 does. And it does so in every part of the body, um, especially the brain. So the brain has some of the highest natural concentration of vitamin K2 in the body. If you recall, we talked about the bioenergetics, um, you know, and I, I described bioenergetics and how you study it. Um, and if you remember from that, what we're looking for is that that spare respiratory capacity. When you when you go from basal respiration, you shut the mitochondria down so that it, it's down to its lowest level of ATP production, and then you stimulate it with FCCP and you get a maximum level, the difference between the basal level and maximum level indicates the, the function, the health, um, and the efficiency of the mitochondria itself. So if you look at the dark blue line versus the thin, uh, the thin blue line, the thin blue line is a um, control substance that is undergoing my, mitochondrial biogenesis, or sorry, uh, that's undergoing the bioenergetics uh, tests under these conditions, then when you add K27 to that same mitochondria, the dark blue line is the improvement in the bioenergetics that you see. So when you look between FCCP and the AAROT, that huge cream area, that's the additional amount of energy that that same mitochondria is now producing just because vitamin K27 is in there. That's almost a 50% increase in energy that the mitochondria can produce with the same amount of substrate, with the same amount of glucose coming in or the same amount of fatty acids. So what K2 is doing is dramatically improving the, the um, efficiency of the mitochondria and, and in some ways reviving it and making it a healthier mitochondria so it's producing its, its uh, high, good, normal level of energy. Now, the way K2 does this is it acts as part of the electron transport chain. Um, if you recall, I mentioned CoQ10 acts as part of the electron transport chain. Vitamin K2 does the same thing within complex two of the mitochondria, and it seems to be more efficient at transporting electrons than even CoQ10 is. Now, the way we, we discovered this is uh, we make our K2 from bacteria, from bacterial fermentation. In fact, it's the same bacteria that are in the spores, uh, sorry, in the megaspore. Uh, it's our bacillus spore-based bacteria. The question for us is why do bacteria make uh, why does bacteria make K27? And, you know, bacteria don't, they don't have bones, they don't have arteries, all these things that we know K2 is good for. So why do they make it? And as it turns out, bacteria 
use K27 as the main transporter in their electron transport chain. So that's when we figured out that, you know what, K2 probably functions in human cells as well to improve the bioenergetics of the mitochondria. And if, and if it does that, then maybe K27 can reverse some uh, neurodegenerative conditions that are characterized by reductions in bioenergetics of the mitochondria. So then we started studying that. So the first one, um, and this is not our study, this was done uh, by a researcher in Belgium, but as we were working on this, this study came out and totally um, collaborated what we were thinking. This, this researcher showed that vitamin K2 is a mitochondrial electron carrier and it rescues people with pink one deficiency. So pink one deficiency is the main deficiency that people have in their mitochondria that leads to the development of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction and, and the slow degeneration of the mitochondria that, that are within your neuronal cells. And then of course your neurons die. And when the neurons die, then the synapses between the neurons aren't functioning. So you can't conduct the neuro neurological electrical signals down um, the uh, your nerves anymore. And so you lose muscle function and you lose uh, muscle control. What they were able to show, and this is an animal model, they didn't do this in humans, but this is a very well published and accepted animal model for Parkinson's disease. They were able to show that they can rescue the neurodegeneration that is caused that that is part of Parkinson's by just adding vitamin K2 back to the system. So not only is K2 improving the bioenergetics of the mitochondria, it seems to be able to rescue dead or dying mitochondria that are already now inefficient and dysfunctional. So we studied the same thing and we looked at peripheral neuropathy. Um, it's so hard to study uh, something like Parkinson's in, uh, in humans. So we looked at something that was very clearly a neurodegenerative condition, um, but it was easier to recruit patients for, and that's peripheral neuropathy. Now, the prevalence of this is getting higher and higher um, every year. And this is basically the numbness and tingling in the extremities, the tips of the fingers, the toes, the legs, um, of course, restless leg syndrome at night. These are all neuropathy type of conditions. And all of these things are characterized by neurodegeneration and the dying of mitochondria. What we were able to show is by the addition of vitamin K2, we were able to reverse, oh, I think it was 80% of all of the cases of peripheral neuropathy within eight weeks of taking vitamin K2. We also studied uh, this with respect to cramping because cramping um, in the muscle is another mitochondrial dysfunctional um, condition. The reason is because um, what happens in a cramp is your muscle contracts and then it doesn't release. So it stays in this contracted cramp uh, format because the release of the muscle also requires ATP. What's happening is your muscles contract and they run out of energy. The cells are not making enough ATP in order to release the muscles and, and release the cramp. So we studied idiopathic muscle cramps. These are people that got very frequent muscle cramps on uh, that could be actually measured and scored. Um, some of them was due to medication. Some of them was just due to lifestyle and diet. Um, but nonetheless, they were getting very frequent muscle cramps. And um, we gave them K2 for eight weeks and we were able to measure the reduction in frequency of muscle cramps over that period of eight weeks. And what we saw was more than an 80% reduction in muscle cramping in these subjects. And that's a, um, a great example of a neurodegenerative condition or sorry, not neurodegenerative, but a dysfunctional mitochondrial condition um, that can be quickly alleviated by having vitamin K2 in there. The other thing we studied was cardiac output. So we're, and again, we're looking at many different ways of proving that vitamin K2 in a human can actually improve mitochondrial function. Cardiac output is another very interesting area because cardiac output is measuring the stroke volume times the heart rate of the heart. And basically it's measuring how much blood the heart is pumping every time it beats. So how efficient is it? How strong is the heart as a muscle? How well does it function? And what's interesting by cardiac output is endurance racing or high intensity exercise. Uh, and, and every time you do more of that, you're increasing the fractional use of your VO2 max or your maximum heart rate. And that ends up causing a decrease in speed and performance 
over time. Now, the reason is because the more we do our respiration, right? So the faster we run, the heavier we lift, the more we lift, um, the more oxidative stress is happening within the body. That oxidative stress, that increase in oxidative stress, at some point creates enough of an imbalance within the muscle tissue where the body can't produce enough energy and it's producing a lot of reactive oxygen species, it starts to actually choke up some of the muscle cells and that ends up causing a weakness or a reduction in the ability to perform. So there's been studies on marathon runners, for example, that have shown that over the course of a race, the athletes tend to increase the amount of um, of energy that they're using closer to their heart rate max. Um, and from around 80% of the heart rate max, this is the amount of work that they're doing. Um, and at, at around 90%, it, it decreases the performance quite a bit. So this heart rate increase is associated with the continuous speed decrease over time. So when you're going between 80 and 90% of your heart rate maximum, your speed is going to decrease over time. And that's because the uh, energy balance, the redox reaction becomes um, uh, imbalanced within the body. The upward drift of heart rate in a, in a component called a cardiovascular drift, this is also correct, characterized by a decrease in stroke volume and overall cardiac output because your heart becomes weaker as a muscle because now it's undergoing more oxidative stress than energy production. And that can be measured as well in, in trained athletes. Um, so there's a number of studies that have uh, been reported on this. This is a common uh, problem in individuals with a high degree of aerobic training. So they see that their maximal heart, uh, as they get closer to the maximal heart rate, they start to see maximal heart rate drops over time. They start to see cardiac output drop over time, again, because those muscles are getting weaker and more uh, and undergoing more oxidative stress. So what we did is we we did a study where we were looking at can vitamin K2 rescue those mitochondria that are undergoing all of that oxidative stress and maintain their ability to, to have high cardiac output and maybe even increase the cardiac output. So maybe even increase the amount of energy they can produce despite the training um, and the expected decrease in cardiac output. We published this paper in uh, this year, I think it was June of this year. Um, and uh, the study basically showed a 12% increase in cardiac output over a eight week period of taking the K2 supplement. This is a 12% increase, which means 12% increase every time your heart beats every minute um, is, uh, is pumping out 12% more blood. So that is equivalent to 60 liters or more blood in one hour's worth of running or working out, right? So 60 liters is a huge amount of, of more oxygen of blood pumping through your system. And that's how much your cardiac output had increased over eight weeks, uh, despite the expectation that it should not only not increase, but it should decrease significantly. Um, and this, the researcher concluded that without Myomax, which is the um, the sports version of our K2 supplement, uh, change months of continuous training to achieve. So the kind of increased fitness that we saw and the health of the heart mu as a muscle would take you about six months of exercise um, that we saw with just eight weeks of supplementation. And then, of course, the prevention of the uh, dis disruption of that mitochondria as well. And then, you know, aside from cardiac output and, and uh, neuropathy, it's also one of the most important anti-aging nutrients because studies indicate that a decrease in cardiac output comes along with age. This is a, a quote from a, um, a, an important study in the journal of geriatric cardiology. Um, the quote says, studies indicate a decrease of cardiac output with aging at rest and with exercise. So a decrease in cardiac output over time is a hallmark of aging. And if we can increase that cardiac output and bring it back up and keep it at a healthier, younger level, we would slow down the process of aging. A substantially reduced output was consistent finding in older subjects. This is another study uh, published um, a long time ago in circulation. Um, and the reason I put this study here, it's published in 1955. It's just to show that there, there's been a significant amount of work over the last 55, 60 years on the relationship between cardiac output and aging and the onset of disease. And so far, nothing but exercise has been able to show to, in, to be able to increase cardiac output. We were the first people to show that a nutrient can actually increase cardiac output 
without any real exercise. So it's uh, quite a significant thing. And again, all of that uh, happens because it's working on the mitochondria and preventing the mitochondria from dying or becoming weak. So the bottom line, you guys remember these three things, low biogenesis, low mitophagy, um, uh, and a cause and redox imbalance. Those are the major driving forces. This leads to all of these kind of conditions, cancers, heart disease, autism. Um, I, you know, the, In fact, there's probably a whole lecture to be done on um, the mitochondria and autism and, of course, the, the um, microbiome connection there. Um, I'm thinking of doing that. I've been asked to speak at the... Um, uh, Autism One conference in Chicago in June. So I think that may be the focus of my presentation. But of course, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, all of these things. Uh, di um, you know, pancreatic cells, which are the ones that are required to make insulin, also require mitochondria and functioning mitochondria. And pancreatic cells will die um, if, if you don't have a healthy microbiome and healthy mitochondrial support. And that leads to type 2 diabetes. That's driven, of course, by endotoxemia. It's also driven by medications. For example, statins. Statins, um, you know, 10% of people that use statins end up de developing diabetes within the first year. And that's because statins act as a mitochondrial toxin. And statins can actually uh, interfere with um, with the uh, glutathione and other functions and increase uh, reactive oxygen species within mitochondria itself. That's how statins end up causing diabetes, liver disease, immune dysfunction, and so on. However, metabolites from the microbiome, like the short-chain fatty acids and all that, increase biogenesis of the mitochondria, increase mitophagy. It also increases mitochondrial output and energetics, thereby creating a better redox balance. It also increases mitochondrial longevity. So we know the mitochondria live longer and function better for a long period of time. It reduces fatty acid accumulation within the cell itself because it stimulates the burning of those fatty acids for energy and clearing out of any damaged components. And it also increases microbiome diversity, which then perpetuates the system all over again. So you've got these three major issues, low biogenesis, low uh, mitophagy, redox imbalances that lead to all of these conditions. But as it turns out, metabolites in the microbiome um, alleviate all of these mechanisms and thereby can be a significant um, uh, help in uh, reducing the risk for many of these kind of conditions. Megaspore, of course, um, increases butyrate production. We know that it increases butyrate production by about 40%. In our latest study that we've done that we're hoping to publish by the second quarter of next year, we've, we've been able to show that Megaspore actually increases the diversity of the microbiome by just taking Megaspore alone. Um, it produces antioxidants which helps with the oxidative stress. It improves absorption of all of these critical nutrients that then need to get to the cell structures within your body. Again, none of it matters if you're not absorbing those nutrients that are being produced in the gut, which, for example, the urolithins that are being produced from polyphenols. So Megaspore plays such an important role. And from this perspective, it plays a significant role in the health and the function of your mitochondria within your cell. You know, maybe before this, this particular talk, it would have been hard to discern how spore-based probiotic or your microbiome could actually affect um, let's say the mitochondria in your heart cell or in your kidneys or your, um, or even your brain cell. But now, hopefully, the mechanisms behind this are clear, and it starts to becoming clear what is really important in um, in ensuring healthy mitochondria. So then the conclusions on the K2 side, uh, of course, we know mitochondrial dysfunctions lead to all of these diseases. Vitamin K2 actually seems to resurrect the mitochondria to improve mitochondrial efficiency. It increases the respiratory capacity, uh, and it seems to improve the bioenergetics of mitochondria, thereby creating much better redox balance. And the fact that it could reverse um, the the ongoing progress of Parkinson's, like it did in that stu in the study published by the Belgium researcher, and then in our case with people with cramps or people with neuropathies, um, where they were able to reverse the neg the already present negative effect, shows that it's rescuing the mitochondria uh, from the destruction. So between these two, between the the megaquinone and the and the megaspore, there's quite a significant impact 
on people's mitochondrial health. And of course, we know how important that is. Um, now, there are some things which I, I totally forgot to make a slide on this. Uh, so I'll just mention it here. But I wanted to also talk about some of the very common things that we're exposed to that seem to really negatively affect mitochondria. The first one is um, xenoestrogens. So mitochondria have numerous estrogen receptors and overbinding of estrogen can actually cause um, a disruption in the mitochondrial bioenergetics. So xenoestrogens, these are chemical estrogen mimics, actually can choke up mitochondria and cause significant dysfunction. Uh, the other thing is acetaminophen. You know, a lot of people use acetaminophen very commonly, um, even with kids. If kids have fever, acetaminophen is supposed to be the safer route than aspirin. Um, of course, there are times when you need it, so I'm not saying cut off acetaminophen. Um, but one of the things that acetaminophen does is it depletes the, the cell of glutathione. So it increases the reactive oxygen species uh, within the cell, which, which then causes all of the damage. Statins, as I mentioned earlier, is another one. Statins are very common use. Um, there's a bunch of side effects of statins. One of them is muscle pain. So if you're familiar with statins, one of the side effects being muscle pain um, indicates that it's actually damaging the mitochondria in the muscle cells, in the smooth muscle cells, sorry, the skeletal muscle cells, as well as the neurons that feed those muscle cells. So you get misfiring of neurons, you get um, unhealthy muscle degeneration, that all leads to kind of the dysfunction and the discomfort in muscle pain is one of the hallmarks of statin use. And of course, the development of type 2 diabetes, which I explained earlier. The other thing is glyphosate. And, and in particular, the formulation within glyphosate and Roundup um, is very toxigenic to mitochondria. Again, it can, it can choke up mitochondria. That's one of the ways in which it kills weeds, it kills bacteria, is by um, arresting the mitochondria. So Getting away from the glyphosate, the Roundup is going to be huge for improving mitochondrial health. Um, and and a fifth thing are are metals. So heavy metals like mercury, aluminum, uh, organophosphates, all of these things suck your body of glutathione and and demand glutathione and and end up neutralizing the function of glutathione within your cells itself. So these all lead to uh, a high amount of oxidative stress which then leads to cellular inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, and then all of the diseases that we just talked about. And um, it's, it's so interesting to me to see the role that the microbiome plays in rescuing all of this. Um, and then of course, you know, the reason why we love vitamin K2 so much is it's such an essential nutrient. Of course, it plays in bone health, heart health, calcium metabolism, but one of the big things it does um, that we focused on was in the health of mitochondria. And it's it's hard to overstate that. So let me go ahead and stop the screen sharing. Maybe we can get into some questions and whatnot. Yeah. And just so everyone knows, I took serious notes on that last little bit that didn't have a slide. So I'll add that in there and then send it out to everyone. So in case you're like, ah, what happened? I got it for you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So first question is a common question we get a lot. Um, but can a patient who is on a blood thinner like Xarelto take vitamin K without any issues? Yeah, especially Xarelto. Um, so the old school blood thinners were all vitamin K antagonists like Coumadin and Warfarin. Um, Coumadin and Warfarin, you could still take vitamin K2 with Coumadin and Warfarin. You just have to be careful and monitor their PTINR or their INR itself to make sure it's still within the range that that you or, or their primary care physician is comfortable with. Um, but with Xarelto uh, and the new generation of blood thinners, they're not vitamin K antagonists. So uh, the vitamin K is no longer a contraindication to it. So they're perfectly fine. Awesome. Um, and then another question is about the difference between MK4 and MK7. Um, so the question was, um, she thought that MK7 was better for bones and mitochondria, other things like we discussed tonight, but that MK4 was better for sex hormone production. So do you have any recommendations regarding MK4? Yeah, so... 
one of the big problems with taking MK4 as a supplement is that all of the MK4 available on the market are all synthetic. There's no natural source of MK4 that can be um, used for production. The The most natural sources of MK4 comes from eating brain and eating organ meats of animals. Because what happens is your body can absorb MK7 from food, from fermented food, in particular things like natto. And then um, in the tissues that require MK4, your body just converts MK7 into MK4. K4. So MK7 is a storage precursor form of K2, and the tissues that require MK4 will simply get it from converting MK7 into MK4. So I always advise against using MK4 supplementation because MK4 supplements are all synthetic chemicals, and and they're not pure synthetic chemicals. Um, you know, if you look at an HPLC of, of an MK4 supplement, you'll see a whole bunch of unknown peaks of chemicals that you don't know what they are, and neither do the manufacturers because they're not prescription drugs. So they're not um, required to identify what all of those chemicals and metabolites are, right? So I just, in, in my opinion, I don't like taking um, chemical vitamins. I'd rather take a natural source and knowing that MK4 is generated in the body anyway, it doesn't seem to matter. Awesome. Um, so this question was, I think, while we were going through the microbiome mitochondria axis, the connection. So mm -hmm. the question was, how do the bad bacteria interrupt that process? So we talked about how the good bacteria can help. Um, can you elaborate on what the bad bacteria can do? Yeah, the access. So the big problem with the bad bacteria is they don't produce short chain fatty acids. Um, and many of them don't produce the, um, the urolithin A as well. So Bad bacteria will convert fibers into gas. Um, good bacteria will convert the fibers into short chain fatty acids like butyrate. So what happens is when you when you are dysbiotic and you have an overgrowth of unfavorable bacteria, your short chain fatty acid, your lithin, lactate production are all much lower than when you have high levels of those good bacteria. And so that becomes the primary dysfunction because butyrate is clearly an essential nutrient for a healthy mitochondria, and we can't produce butyrate ourselves. So we count on it uh, from the microbiome. If you don't have a lot of high-level butyrate-producing bacteria within your gut, you're going to have a butyrate deficiency, and you're going to end up with mitochondrial dysfunctions because of that. Same thing goes with the urolithin A. Gotcha. Okay, uh, the next question was, can you comment on nicotinamide riboside for mitochondrial health and biogenesis? Sure, it's a, it's a very um, important part of the, the, the Krebs cycle and feeding the, the uh, mitochondria with energy in order to convert glucose into ATP. Um, and, and your body can produce it as well. Um, there's, there's some data and evidence that the microbiome can produce it as well. But again, that's a component of the respiratory process within the mitochondria. Um, and, and even if you have adequate amounts of that component, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to um, have high efficiency in AT, ATP production. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to quench ROS at an effective rate. It doesn't mean you're going to increase uh, the biogenesis of mitochondria, and it doesn't mean you're going to increase the, um, the removal of damaged mitochondria. So those are the big overlaying factors that determine the overall health of your cells and overall health the mitochondria. Uh, nicotinamide, you know, all versions of NAD, NADPH, um, acetyl-CoA, all of these things will help drive the, the metabolic process in the mitochondria, but still those overarching issues are the ones that cause the long-term disruption and damage. Got it. Um, the next question was about infrared light. So if infrared light can heal some cells, would that also translate to cancer cells? So that maybe be a contraindication for people with cancer or um you know uh it, i've i've never seen any studies on infrared and and cancer i've looked at a lot of infrared um studies because i i I have an infrared sauna myself, and I sit in it all the time. And I'll probably sit in it right after we're done here. Um, you know, to me, the the way that infrared actually 
heal cells is just by increasing circulation. Um, you know, we we may come out to find out that there's some photometabolic pathways and things like that that we're not aware of right now. But from a simplistic standpoint, standpoint right now, it's what it's doing is increasing circulation without increasing your core temperature too high, which puts you in the danger zone or dehydrates you too fast. And it also gets deeper into your tissue. And it's not this kind of peripheral heat that you get from just a regular sauna that that increase in um in temperature and and increase in circulation just explains the blood vessels brings more oxygen more nutrients all of that stuff to the cells which allows the cells to turn over more um, to get rid of the toxins to get rid of the um, damaged parts of the of the cell structure and and just function the way they're supposed to so to me that's the main function of it. So then how does that play into cancer? Well, that's hard to say. I mean, the whole issue with cancer is that the cells have now gone immortal. They are also somehow evading detection by the immune system. Because remember, the immune system is one of the, the most potent anti-cancer factors that we have. It's constantly looking for tumorigenic cells and suppressing the growth of tumorigenic cells. So now when you have a cancer that's developed, you've somehow the cancer cells are cloaked um, away from the immune system, typically because of excessive inflammation. And then also the mitochondria and the DNA within that cell is totally dysfunctional and now it's an immortal cell. Um, you know, I, I can't think from a scientific standpoint, or at least from a study standpoint, you know, whether infrared would be a contraindication or supportive of that, you know. Gotcha. Um, going back to K2, is there any downside with very high dosing? Um, sorry, where, any downside with very high dosing of K2? Yeah, with, with high so, dose. Yeah, so K27, we haven't found a um, like an LD50, for example. When you when you do a safety study, um, one of the first things you che check is an LD50. If you're not familiar with what that is, so LD is lethal dose 50. That means you take animals and you dose them very at very, very high levels of the nutrients. Typically, we're talking about a thousand, two thousand times what would be the recommended dose for a human. Um, and then you look for the lethal dose, the dose that killed the animal. Then you go half of that lethal dose as the new maximum dose of the nutrient and the safe, effective level of that nutrient. Um, with K2, we've done and we've published these safety studies. We have not found an LD50. We can dose animals at four, five, six thousand times the, the human dose. And there's and still nothing negative happens. So um, so far we haven't found any sort of lethality or toxigenic level for vitamin K two seven. Um, I myself on many occasions are taking three, four, five hundred uh, micrograms a day, um, and that depends on my activity level and all that. Uh, but in, in the Japanese food natto, they get upwards of 800 micrograms, um, depending on how much natto they eat, they might even get a full milligram of K27. Those are very, very high doses. And um, there's never been a uh, report of a contraindication. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, the next question is again about K2. Um, how much should we take? When should we take it with food or with not? And is there a certain time of day that's best to take it? Yeah, so um, you know, we designed the Mega Quinone product to to be the optimal dose of vitamin K two that we know of now. You know, and that's the beauty of following science. Like we would never say that this product is the be all end all. This is a perfect supplement. This is the greatest thing. Based on the information we have now, this is the most optimum supplement. And the reason is it's got 320 micrograms as the daily dose. So far, when you look at the pharmacokinetic studies that have been published. 320 micrograms seems to be the max dose where you get, or, or the, the minimum dose where you get all of the maximum benefit of K2. Um, now, we might come up five years from now with a study that shows that six or 700 micrograms um, have even more effect. At that, at that point, we will totally change our product. Um, or if a study comes out that shows that over 200 micrograms is just a waste and you don't need to exceed that, we'll change your product for that too. So right now the product is designed based on the existing science to give you 320 micrograms, which we believe in the study support is the most efficient and the best dose. And taken twice a day seems to be the best way to do it. Um, and that's in the morning and in the evening with a meal. So K2 is absorbed 
um, as part of the fatty acid system. So when you have a meal, if there's any sort of even small amount of fat in the meal, bile is released in your in your small intestine. When bile is released, K2 actually goes and aggregates with the bile and gets absorbed actively through the bile system. Um, so that's why it's important to take it with food. Um, and, and, and in fact, a pharmacokinetic study that was published showed that even the tiny, tiny amount of fat in orange juice was enough to increase the absorption of K2. So you, you don't have to have a gigantic meal with it. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll just take my K2 with a banana or something, and um, and that seems to do the trick. Awesome. Um, the next question is, how does butyrate affect fungal activity in the gut? Um Um, that's a good doesn't seem to increase the metabolism of fungus. Um, fungus don't use uh, butyrate as a very good and effective energy source. Um, and so butyrate will disproportionately, in a good way for us, um, increase the growth of lactic acid producing bacteria. And when it does that, it acidifies the environment, which actually... Um, goes against what's favorable for the fungus. So I think high levels of butyrate actually become a very good natural selection against fungal overgrowth in the body. Okay, very cool. Um, what do you think about the butyric acid on the market, like butyrate as a supplement? Yeah, so um, butyric acid can be extremely unstable. I don't believe that there's enough science to show that it's absorbed effectively either all the way in the colon um, or um, in, into the cells in the body itself. Now, most of the studies in the use of um, exogenous butyrate, that's any butyrate from outside of the body, um, and getting benefit has come from cancer research where they're actually doing butyrate enemas because the whole idea is trying to get the butyrate right into the colon. So if you're consuming the butyrate and it has to go through the gastric system, it has to go through 20 something feet of small intestines and so on, it's more than likely being used up or, or uh, dissipated somehow before it even gets to the colon. So I don't know that there's that much of a benefit to it. Um, you know, the best thing to do is just increase your natural butyrate production by increasing your butyrate forming bacteria, like with Megaspore. Megaspore increases butyrate production by 40%, and that's compared to a healthy microbiome. Um, and then there's certain prebiotics that really favor the growth of butyrate producing bacteria. Um, and we're actually working on that. It's something called precision prebiotics. We're creating this new genre of prebiotics where we're using prebiotics that are extremely precise for the types of microbes that it supports the growth of and doesn't support the growth of harmful microbes, which is what general prebiotics can do. They can, they can feed good and bad bacteria almost equally. And so we're, we're developing these precision prebiotics so that they can specifically feed butyrate forming bacteria, helpful, good uh, genres of bacteria within the gut like acromancia, uh, uh, fecalum bacteria, bifidobacteria, for example. And as it turns out, bifidobacteria is actually one of the main bacteria that produce their, their uh, urolectins as well. Um, so they become extremely important in um, mitochondrial health overall. But the idea is just, you know, get butyrate production naturally through your gut, through the back microbes. Right. Awesome. Um, would any of this help for a person with myotonic dystrophy? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would because, because we are dealing with, um, you know, the, uh, the, the health of the colonocytes and all of this, um, and, and the health of the colonocytes will play a role in, in that condition. And so, I mean, I'm trying to think now if I've read any papers uh, that directly correlate them um, or, or even show a mechanistic um, uh, correlation, which I can't think of any papers that have done so, but just from understanding the mechanisms, you know, the, the health of the colonocytes uh, will play a significant role in the condition. And so I think if we're improving colonocyte function, we should be helping it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this question is in regards to K2, but it says, is there an interaction with MCT oil? 
Uh, no interaction in any negative way. No, I mean, uh, typically any oils or fats will help K2 absorb. And again, that's because of the release of bile. Um, but we're not aware of any interaction where MCT either negates K2 absorption or increases it. Um, there, there really is no data on that. Um, but, but I don't think K2 would actually be in, inhibited by MCT in any way. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, ca- um, ha- be cautious about using MCT and K2 at the same time. Cool. Um, the next question is about how megaspore can produce a little bit of K2. So do we know roughly how much K2 is naturally produced when you're taking megaspore? You know, no, um, no, because it really depends on the individual's microbiome, right? So um, uh, megaspore strains can produce K2, but most of that K2 that's being produced by the strains of, of megaspore are being metabolized and utilized by the other bacteria within the gut itself because it's produced basically in the lumen and excreted into the lumen where all the other microbes are some of it i'm sure is being absorbed um but but probably the vast majority of it is being utilized by the bacteria in the gut and so depending on how dysbiotic they are how many other you know butyrate forming k2 producing bacteria they have within the gut they either may use up vast majority of the k2 or maybe some of it gets absorbed um we don't feel that there's a um, therapeutic amount of K2 that's being produced by just taking Megaspore. Um, so that's why we feel that um, K2 supplementation is extremely important. Hence, we created the product. It would have been amazing if we could show that Megaspore gave you the full therapeutic value of K2, then we wouldn't have to have the two products. Um, uh, but, but you know, we, we actually tried looking, and from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, we can't really say with any clarity that you're getting X amount of K2 into your system from what's being produced in the gut. Right. Okay. Um, We'll do two more questions uh, just so I know you guys have been with us forever. So thank you for your time. Um, Okay. So the other question is K2 is touted to boost testosterone in men and aid in PCOS in women. Does this mean it addresses estrogen dominance? Um, Not necessarily because um, estrogen dominance is an issue of your, the body's inability to clear estrogen. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're producing a lot of estrogen. Now, um, in bone, we know that K2 actually has an estrogenic effect because one of the things that estrogen does in bone is prevent bone resorption. And K2 seems to do the same thing. Hence, women, when they hit uh, perimenopausal and postmenopausal age, they end up suffering from more osteoporosis because the bone resorption part, which is breaking down a bone to pull calcium out, is not slowed down uh, as much because there's less estrogen in the system. Um, but K2 seems to also do the same thing in bone. Now, we're not aware that K2 has any other um, functions similar to estrogen anywhere else in the body. Um, but uh, w- what I do know is that estrogen dominance is really very much tied to estrobilome. Estrobilome is the constellation of bacteria that that exists in the microbiome whose primary job it is is to clear estrogen itself. And if you have low diversity in your microbiome, low levels of estrobilome, you're not clearing estrogen from your system and you end up with an estrogen dominant uh, system. So um, there's no data to indicate that K2 affects estrobilome right now. Um, and, and so, and maybe that's something we will look into, but that's, it's an interesting area. Uh, but as far as we know, um, I don't, I don't, I've never seen data that shows that K2 can help with estrogen dominance. The, the spores will probably help more because we know that increased diversity in the microbiome helps clear um, estrogen. So that, that would be um, a better shot at helping estrogen dominance. Gotcha. Okay, for the last one, um, these are kind of a combo of two questions, but um, is there a relationship between uh, vitamin K2 and vitamin D slash vitamin A? I'm mixing two questions together. Yeah, no, that's um, that's that's a very important question. I'm glad someone asked it. In fact, there's a very critical um, relationship between all fat soluble vitamins. So they all affect one another. So, um, A, D, E, and K. Um, the clear one, the very clear one is, is A and D. So we know that vitamin A and vitamin D both have toxigenic levels. There is a condition called hypervitaminosis D. Hypervitaminosis D is a very well established, um, toxigenic, uh, effect of vitamin D. If you get 
too high a levels. When you look at hypervitaminosis D, the pathogenesis of it is it causes massive amounts of soft tissue calcification. So hypervitaminosis D has the same pathology as severe deficiency in vitamin K27. The reason for that is vitamin D um, stimulates vitamin K, um, vitamin K dependent proteins. For example, osteocalcin. Osteocalcin is that final protein that grabs calcium and sticks it on the bone. Um, osteocalcin is released by something called osteoblastic cells. But osteocalcin is released in an inactive form. It has to be activated by vitamin K2 or carboxylated. Vitamin D stimulates the release of osteocalcin, and then vitamin K2 comes along and activates as osteocalcin. So if you're getting a whole bunch of vitamin D in your system, you know, people are taking 50,000, 100,000 IUs a day and not getting the K2, What's happening is you're releasing a lot of vitamin K dependent proteins. So you're using up all your K2 in order to activate those proteins. And now you've gone into a severe vitamin K deficiency state. And then you can end up with soft tissue calcification and you know heart disease and so on because of it. Same thing with vitamin uh, A. Vitamin A can also drive similar uh, imbalance between both D and K. So I would say this, it's if you're taking vitamin K by itself, it's not an issue. You're not going to run into a problem where you're take, getting too much vitamin K. But if you're taking vitamin A and vitamin D, you definitely need to get vitamin K into your system to balance those two out so you don't end up with a uh, dysfunction. Then the last part is it's best to take them all together because they do all work synergistically. Just from that example of vitamin D and vitamin K in bone health, uh, we know that you can't build bone without osteocalcium being released, which means you need vitamin D. And then you can't build a bone without that osteocalcium being activated, which means you need vitamin K. So they all work synergistically in, in wonderful balance. So it's extremely important to get them all into your system um, and not just, um, uh, just the D, for example, which is, you know, kind of going rampant. People are going crazy with D. Now, people often ask me, here, let me ask you guys a question f on your behalf. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of people will say, well, why didn't you put vitamin D and vitamin A into your product and into the megaquinone? Well, the reason is because we found that in, in just looking around, um, talking to people, looking at the clinical research on um, on intake and prevalence rate of, of vitamin A and D deficiencies, what you tend to find is that people, for the most part, get adequate amounts of vitamin A and vitamin D. The problem is they don't get adequate amounts of all three fat-soluble vitamins at once uh, or at this, in the same day. And so we didn't think people needed any more vitamin D or any more vitamin A. Um, and you're probably eating foods that already have high levels of vitamin A and vitamin D. There's no way you're eating foods that have high levels of vitamin K2 in it because you're not eating natto, the fermented soy, you're not eating organ meats and brains. So we know that from a dietary standpoint, 90% of the Westerners are highly deficient in K, but they seem to get adequate amounts of DNA. So we just wanted to add the K back in to balance the whole thing out. Awesome. Okay, so if we didn't get to your question, we are going to compile them and send them out via email. Um, but I don't want to keep you guys any longer because it's almost two hours and I'm like so surprised you're all still with us. So thank you so much for your time um, and for hanging out with us. I uh, hope you all have lovely holidays. And if you haven't already, I'd really encourage you to go on to our website and register and create an account. Um, it's www.microbiomelabs.com. So if you already have an account, then when you log in, you can go on the left side of the menu and we have what's called a practitioner's dashboard. There we keep a lot of our research. We have links to these webinars. Uh, we have clinical grand rounds. So it's a really great resource for you guys. Um, and then if you, and you can also go to your profile and set that to public or private. So if you want to be found by people who are just coming to our website, trying to get a hold of Megaspore or Megaquinone, they can just type in their address and see who's near them. Um, so that's a good way for you guys to get some clients as well. Um, so again, yep. thank you all. Yeah, and um, let me mention one more thing. I just a quick comment, which I think is a very important thing. Um, I think um, someone had mentioned that most people are deficient in vitamin D. Um, that's actually a very controversial area. We don't know that, actually. 
Um, the, the reason why people think people are deficient in vitamin D is based on the vitamin D test. Um, and, and if you dig into the research, you'll come to find out that there's a lot of inconsistencies um, with the vitamin D assay that, that, you're, that you have access to in order to test that. Also, the normal ranges within the assays are not really based on any disease conditions. Uh, they're based on kind of what averages you see. And remember, vitamin D is a, is a vitamin that we make ourselves. We can synthesize it ourselves from sunlight and from cholesterol. So, um, you know, vitamin D intake orally doesn't seem to be that important. And, and I would encourage everyone to start reading um, studies on vitamin, true vitamin D deficiency and whether or not the tests reveal it. So that's a big rabbit hole that you can go down, but someone made the comment. So I wanted uh, people to, to be aware of that so that you could look into that. It's a really important topic because because of this perceived deficiency in vitamin D, people go crazy with taking a lot of vitamin D. And you can look now, there's actually a large study published earlier this year that showed that vitamin D seems to dramatically increase risk for heart disease as well. So we want to be careful and not go crazy with, with certain things um, and, and get established more balance. Um, that's the last word. That's the last thing I'm going to say in 2017. Uh, I'm not talking for the rest of the year. Uh, so if anyone wants to hear from me the rest of the year, I will just be signing or do mime-like uh, gestures. But other than that, I'm not talking anymore for this year. But I'll leave you with that, vitamin D. And I'm sure um, Acacia will be back with more of this kind of stuff in 2018, right? Yeah, yeah. In 2018, our next webinar is going to be on autoimmunity. So we haven't picked a date yet because Karan's tired of talking. But once we pick that date, we'll send it out to you and you can all subscribe to that. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Happy holidays.